on this edition of Native Report. We attend a rally to change the mascot. We go into the studio and hear a performance by rapper Chase Manhattan. We still have and we continue to, to celebrate our 10th back. season by remembering Federal treaty Federal rights Federal advocate Federal Billy Federal. Frank Jr. We also learn something new about Indian Country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community and the Blandon Foundation. Welcome to Native Report, I'm Stacy Thunder. Change the Mascot is a national campaign to end the use of the R word as the Washington football team's name and mascot. Thousands of protesters were at TCF Stadium in Minneapolis to urge the NFL to do the right thing, end the use of the racial slur. Ani Pujul. My name is Melanie Benjamin, and I'm from the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, the non-removable. We are proud to be Anishinaabe. We are proud to be sovereign Indian nations. We are proud to be Minnesota Vikings fans, but we are not mascots. Supporters by the thousands turned out for a rally outside TCF Stadium as the Washington, D.C. football team played the Minnesota Vikings. The Change the Mascot campaign was launched by the Oneida Nation of New York. Well, Dan Snyder and the NFL would like to pretend that we don't exist as Indian people, that our voice is not to be heard. And quite the opposite is true. This event shows there's a broad coalition of support from Native America, as well as other groups, NAACP, uh, political leaders, media, have all recognized that this uh, needs to be changed. The name needs to be changed. It's a racist, defined slur right out of the dictionary. You know, a lot of us have grown up in this modern society where we've seen images and media and in the press and cartoons, and we may not really think much about it. But for me, you know, it became clear that this was an issue when I was uh, working on my MFA at the University of Illinois, where they have a dancing mascot called Chief Alinewick. I was there in 1988 to 91, and so. Um, for me, you know, it became clear because it was undermining the self-esteem of my children. So that was my beginning. You know, back in 1988 and up to 91, um, there was a lot of people, even our own people, Native people, who didn't think this was an issue. But I think we've been able, through uh, the many, many years of work, uh, to make the connections between dehumanization and the violence that we face every day in Indian country, the dehumanization and the disrespect of our tribal leaders, and the hopelessness that our children feel. You know, we've been able to make the connection between dehumanization and all of the statistics that we all quote as we're talking about Native issues. We are here standing with you, and if you are insulted, we are insulted. This campaign has many supporters, such as Minnesota Congressman Keith Ellison. One of the more vocal supporters is Congresswoman Betty McCollum, who co-chairs the U.S. House Native American Caucus. This is from the Daily Republican in Winona, and we found this last year working with the Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, 1863, September 24th, so we're, we're a state now. The state reward for dead Indians has been increased to $200 for every red skin sent to purgatory. This sum is more than the dead bodies of all the Indians east of the Red River are worth. Every other ethnic minority in this country and Europeans who came over um, who had derogatory 
names associated with them, they're not used in the public sphere. Why is it okay to still use this hateful speech? When you label a group of people, when you continue to use a term that means that someone is less than subhuman, and we're fighting for dollars for children to have better educational outcomes, good, safe schools, when we're working to get elders access to, to you know, dialysis, to have this out there in the public sphere is just wrong. And I don't think the NFL and the owners, if once they really understand the impact of this term, I think we're going to change the mascot. One victory in the effort is the decision by the U.S. Patent and Trade Office canceling the Washington team's trademark on the basis that it is disparaging to Native Americans. Still, there is much that needs to be done. We're accomplishing a lot here today just by making this whole issue awareness in the state of uh, Minnesota and the country and to let people know that enough is enough. Let's stop this. No more of the R word. When you look at American Indian people, we are religious, we are teachers, doctors, we are everything, warriors, veterans, grandmothers, mothers, and we are not mascots. As a child, I could not learn my language, culture, or history because they had to protect us back then when we didn't have any rights to have uh, to speak our language or do our culture or anything like that. So now, playing in the NFL, being having a success is that. In this time and age, I'm able to go back, go to my roots. I'm able to stand up and say I'm a native, I'm an indigenous person. I'm here for my mother, my father, their mothers and fathers, my great grandparents, all those that I was able to see or to touch or to learn from. I'm standing here today for their rights as being human beings here in America that are indigenous. There's a huge amount of people here, and I think there's a lot of crowd that was, uh, uh, you know, on the outside that was told about what was going on here today, and that's that's all part of it, the enlightenment of what we're trying to do. And so as the fans walk into the stadium and, and the news stations uh, around the Twin Cities tell people about, you know, the extra time they might need to get here because there will be a little uh, extra activity going on, um, they'll, they'll seek to find out why. And they can't help but walk by and, and become enlightened on this issue. Oh, it's disappointing to find out that, you know, Washington got scheduled to, to come here. And um, maybe it's a blessing that we are able to have this rally because of that. We, we, we didn't support alcohol at the stadium when the university wanted to bring alcohol to it. But we were able to say, we don't support that. But, you know, then again, that's their, that's their choice. And the same with the NFL and, and its owners and Dan Snyder. And this, this, that's his choice. If he wants to continue to do and promote uh, the racial slur that the name uh, implies, then, then that's his right. But people still need to be educated on this issue and how it affects us. Standing together, we will win this human rights victory. Let's make it clear to Dan Snyder, all of us, say it with me in capital letters. We are not mascots. Again, we are not mascots. Again, we are not mascots. Miigwech. Did you know that Billy Frank Jr. was arrested more than 50 times? Billy Frank Jr. was a Native American environmental leader and treaty rights activist born in 1931. A Nisqually tribal member, Billy was known for his grassroots campaign for fishing rights on the tribe's Nisqually River in the 1960s and 70s. Tribes reserved the right to hunt, fish, and gather shellfish in treaties with the U.S. government negotiated in the 1850s. But when tribal members tried to exercise those rights off the reservation, they were arrested for fishing in violation of state law. Billy was arrested more than 50 times in the fish wars of the 1960s and 70s because of his intense dedication to the treaty rights fishing cause. The tribal struggle was taken to the courts in U.S. v. Washington, 
and Judge George Hugo Bolt found in favor of Native Americans in 1974. The Bolt decision established the 20 treaty Indian tribes in Western Washington as co-managers of the salmon resource with the state of Washington. One of the most beloved people in all Native America, Billy was chairman of the Northwest Indian Fish Commission for more than 30 years and was a national figure in both the environmental and tribal treaty rights battles. Billy Frank Jr. died on May 5, 2014, and his funeral was attended by more than 6,000 people. Next, Chase Manhattan is an award-winning hip-hop rap artist based out of the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Chase visited the Native Report studio to talk about his music and to give us a performance. I said, uh. Yeah, I'm riding with my people. Get fresh at the club in clean clothes, and everybody gonna celebrate. Redskins, my Negroes. Drop the beat like a sing code, throwing singles. Can't stop it, get it popping like Pringos. Booty shaking as beast mode. I wonder if that's legal when you hustle like me. Man, it's hard for you to be broke. Stay out the way of my ego. Like when I started rap music, I didn't, you know, start doing it just to rap to Native American people. I just started rapping just to be rapping, you know, and I wanted to be up there with everybody. I didn't want to be held in a, you know, a corner, especially, I mean, Native American, we have like the smallest population here, you know, so I mean, I've been venturing out like, I mean, I venture out with everybody. I, I do a, most of my like little open mics. I mean, it's heavy with the black community and a lot of the shows I do there in the, the cities. And then, I mean, I've been getting into like the, the Latino community. So like doing like shows on Lake Street and I do that annually. So I always have a show like, like once or twice a year on Lake Street and it's like their Cinco de Mayo festival. So just wherever, you know, I, I try to get in with everybody. Chase Manhattan, what can you tell me about the name? When I was younger, my brother, uh, he had went to like Manhattan with his uh, friend. So they had went there and they like had dreams of being rappers too at the time. So they went to Manhattan and tried to like go harass record companies or whatever. And when they came back, his friend had been like, what up man? He's like, what up Chase, Chase Manhattan. And I mean, ever since then, I kind of just stuck with that name. You know, I didn't like it at first, like, cause I was probably like 13, 14, but like, you know, I didn't like it at the time, but everybody started calling me Manhattan and then just kind of stuck with that, you know, and then I just, I didn't really want to make up a rap name and I already had that nickname, so I just, you know, ran with it. Tell me a little bit about the creation process. What are you uh, thinking about when you're uh, creating music? Uh, it really just depends on like, you know, what kind of song I'm making, I guess, you know, like more so lately I've been doing a lot more just, you know, just whatever I feel like, I guess, you know, but for a while there, like when I was producing like Tribal Tribulations or even a lot on Alienated, you know, I um, I really had concepts I wanted to work with. So like I made a track for my brother called Big Brother, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if anybody knows, but uh, my brother had passed away in 2009. My friend had made a beat, so he, he made this beat and it had that real kind of, you know, feeling to it. I don't know what it was, man. It was just like a real deep feeling. And I just kind of, you know, knew that I was gonna make a track for him with that beat. So it really just depends on like what kind of beats it are. The younger community, we all listen to hip hop. Hip hop's in everything now. So, I mean, it's like, in the, it's in country, it's in, you know, it's in rock, it's in, you know. I mean, we use all that type of stuff to make our rap music. We use every type of genre of music to in, incorporate into, um, you know, our beats and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's really, it's really just our own twist on things. Uh, I'm just an artist that is native, you know, but I, I mean, I do do art for the native people, you know, so I mean, because, you know, again, like, you know, there's always that, that, uh, you know, you, you don't want to be put in the box, you know what I mean? And that's kind of what it kind of feels like sometimes, you know, when people try to, you know, they'd be like, oh, he's a Native American artist or, I mean, I like it. I like it in both sides, you know what I mean? But, you know, depending on what it is, sometimes try to say native hip hop and those genres and do like, uh, you know, they'll be like, oh, it's native hip hop. And then like, we get put in the same kind of category. There's a lot of people that may be not so good at hip hop, you know, I guess, <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, I don't like to be put in there because I compete with everybody, you know what I mean? When I started rap music, I didn't, you know, start doing it just to rap to Native American people. I just started rapping just to be rapping, you know, and I wanted to 
be up there with everybody. I didn't want to be held in a, you know, a corner. My brother back in the day, when I started making um, music, he had been telling me, he's like, you know what you should do? You should, uh, you know, you should incorporate, you know, do a song for like the natives, you know what I mean? Telling me I should do a song for the natives, saying that, you know, if you do that, you know, you'll, you know, you probably blow up, you'll get a good following and all that kind of stuff. So he had been a strong influence on telling me that I should probably do something like that for the Native American people. Put in work for long days, take over on pays, drive like a car chase, do a show if the bar pays, on my own part days, want a banger, call my boy Nate, haters blow up in they face, don't make me catch a case, you can see me anywhere, any place, ask around, who hold it down? In my state, Minnesota, like a dead place, the game. Then I vacate, they recognize my face. Since I caught a little fame, now they know my name. Man, I hustle through the rain. If I was you, I'd do the same thing. Didn't have to rep a game. Let me see it, I don't wanna know what you claim. It's not where you're from, it's how far that you can't aim. I'm gonna rock stages for a long time, like, and I hope it's just bigger and bigger venues and, you know, bigger festivals. You know, I'm just waiting for everybody to book me at every single reservation on the United States, so, you know, and Canada, so, you know, I'm just, I just wanna do it all, you know, anything I can do as far as, you know, this music can take me, cause it's, you know, it's something I enjoy and I just like doing it. From the state of the lakes, newest flavor since I gave them a taste. I've been uh, a carver my whole life. It's just something that's inside of me. The Creator uh, gives everyone a gift, and my gift must be sculpting. And if you neglect a gift that the Creator gives you, it's going to be hard to uh, lead a, a happy and healthy life. So everybody was given a gift. They have a, a special thing that they can do. And it's up to you to pursue it and uh, to bring beauty and nature to everyone. I heard uh, on Native American calling the other day one man saying that we live in heaven. Why, why would we even have to worry about the next life when we live in heaven right now? Have all of the clean, fresh air, fresh water, the food that grows on the water. We're in heaven. To celebrate our 10th season of Native Report, We've been featuring the people we've met and the places we've been. This week's story from the Native Report archive profiles the late Billy Frank Jr., longtime chairman of the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission and a legendary environmental leader and treaty rights advocate. On this fall afternoon, the history and future of treaty rights in the Northwest is a topic at the annual gathering of the National Congress of American Indians. You know, when I was uh, six, seven years old, there was salmon in the river. You know, every coho salmon, right now this time of the year, fall salmon, Chinook salmon, steelhead, chum salmon, winter fishery, and then we go back to the spring salmon again, and then the summer salmon. We had a fishery all around the whole, uh, the whole calendar year. They're gone now. There's no more fishery anymore. It's like the buffalo are gone, you know. And so, you know, we're, we, we still have a chance to bring these salmon back. If the federal government will, will uh, 
will uh, do what they have to do when it comes to the treaty of, of our treaties, our five treaty areas. The habitat's gone, you know. There's no in-stream flows. There's some on some rivers and some on the rest, you know. So what they're doing, the state of Washington, they turned their authority. EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, in Seattle, federal, they turned their authority over to the state of Washington on water, clean water. And so, you know, they gotta take that back. They've gotta, I mean, you know, there's wells being drilled now throughout all of our, uh, our uh, state of Washington, you know, just drilling wells all over. And all of a sudden we see our creeks where the spawning beds are going down. Chairman Frank and other members of the panel related their stories of protecting their treaty rights to fish free from state regulation and interference. I grew up on the, on the river, born and raised on the Squally River, the mouth of the river. And that was our, our uh, in the First World War, our Squally Reservation, two-thirds of it was bought by the military and for army purposes, for training troops. And so they moved my dad from Muckrick Village down to the mouth of the river and uh, replaced him. And then they took that land into, into restricted trust status, like the reservation, but it was clean off in the reservation. It was eight miles off the reservation. So now we're sitting on the mouth of the river, and that's where I was born and raised, and I start fishing. I was 14 years old now when, when I uh, went to jail, you know, and, and got arrested for fishing off the reservation. They said, you can go fish on the reservation, but you can't fish off the reservation. And I said, well, we, you know, we got a treaty with the United States, and we can fish anywhere in this using the custom fishing area and what we did in 1854 and 55 is we signed this treaty with the United States and from Canada to the Columbia River and on the western side of the mountain and uh, it took in millions of acres of land and we, that was our using the custom fishing area. And I said well that's what I go by and the state said, no, that ain't what you go by. You go by our laws. All Billy and other treaty rights activists wanted was for treaties to be upheld, since they are the law of the land. It was just an anti-Indian movement in, in our lifetime. We started to have fish-ins, you know, and we had all of the, the uh, actors and, you know, Marlon Brando and Buffy St. Marie and Jay Silverheels and, and uh, you know, all of the, the rock and roll guys, they all supported us, you know, the Grateful Dead and, and the Monkees and all of these, everybody, you know, they, are, they wanted to keep, keep, keep fighting for your right, you know, that's the state's wrong doing this. Celebrity involvement was important but it was another event that changed the course of tribal history. We're gonna fish on the Puyallup River off the reservation. And so uh, we, uh, it was a beautiful day, like uh, fall day, the silver salmon were running, coho salmon, and, and, uh, and so the, this, this day, the city of Tacoma State Patrol Washington Department of Fish and Game and all the department and the sheriffs, they all come down and rested us. They took our fish camp, rested about 200 of us and our kids and everybody. And uh, so that was, and they gassed us that day. They, they gassed all of us. And the U.S. US attorney uh, that we were trying to get him to take our case all this time, you know, hey, you come and take our case. No, we can't take your case. And he got gassed that day. And he finally took our case, U.S. <laughs> versus Washington. That's how it got into court. Billy Frank spent his life fighting for tribal fishing rights. Today, he fights for the environment. The state of Washington has killed all the wild salmon. There's no viable salmon anymore. We wake up every day, we gotta fight, you know every day. 
we're not, you know, it isn't over, and it never will be over. We're going to win this battle. You know, we have to win it. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, find us at nativereport.org, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you for spending time with us here on Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. We'll see you again. Stacy Thunder is Ojibwe from the Red Lake and Lakota Ray Nations and is the legislative counsel for the Malax Band of Ojibwe. Professor Ted Johnson is the director of the Master of Tribal Administration and Governance program at the University of Minnesota Duluth and is an enrolled member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community and the Blandon Foundation. Closed captioning is provided by the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Partial funding for this episode of Native Report is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund.